right, so what I would like to present to you today is uh, called DX. Um, it's a pragmatic inference system based on your ECTO schema. So um, I'll give you some background first. Um, yeah, um, so I, as, as you said, Eric, um, I've been working as a freelancer since the beginning of last year. And I um, started uh, with consulting work and um, I got into a project um, where a friend of mine uh, used to work back then. And they have been building up a um, web app over four years by then already that um, has um, attracted a lot of customers. And um, they had some problems with it, with uh, scaling it um, in, in terms of complexity. And this is what the, where the story begins today. So I would like to present you um, the app called Team Engine. Uh, it's a UK-based company. And it's uh, doing business in the film and TV industry. So basically, UK film and TV productions, um, a large fraction of them uh, use Team Engine to, to manage their um, offers and uh, also time cards, uh, offers uh, for, for their crew. Um, so you have to imagine it's an industry where for each film and TV, a new company is set up. Um, many people are hired to to fulfill various roles for big for, for the major blockbuster productions. Several thousand people in, in various roles, and there's a huge amount of complexity be, um, because, um, for example, there's ten different types of overtime because uh, people don't have like regular work days. At least most of them. Some do, like maybe when they're not working on set. But uh, if you're working on set, shooting scenes and so on, um, it's crazy. And there's uh, union agreements where you have uh, detailed rules for how uh, what overtime applies, how the rates are calculated. And that might depend on which union agreement um, the, the crew has, um, what role your job is in, what's your tax status. Um, and then projects have a large amount of customization as well. So um, that's where basically the complexity lies. It's in the business requirements. So this is a fact. This is something it's, uh, like you, you can only optimize so much because you have to um, cater to all these cases. I would have said edge cases, but there's actually then everything would be an edge case. <laughs> it's just a huge level of complexity. And um, how they tackled it is, um, using a preloading approach. So you use Ecto um, with your various uh, schemas and you preload all the data you might potentially need and then run them through functions um, with pattern matching using lots of uh, if, else, uh, cont statements um, and enum to evaluate the logic. And then also sometimes you need to to load some extra data um, that cannot be preloaded because it's more specific, then you need to pass that in using arguments. And as you could maybe imagine, the um, nesting level of, of these functions, what calls what, is, is very deep. Um, so a basic, um, let's say, minimal set of data that gets preloaded like this is uh, here. That's uh, gets a single offer. I've tried to fit it on one page. Um, it just You don't need to read it through. It's just um, basically showing you it's a lot of data and a lot of different types of data that are needed in order to evaluate the logic. So that's where I came in. And I basically, I had a look. I worked on some of the um, new features or, or different requirements. Sometimes there's also just new legal requirements that you have to um, then adjust to. And um, so I thought about now what would actually make sense here. I mean, that's uh, all good and fine to use, you know, paradigms and uh, think about um, what kind of uh, conventions there are 
um, how you split up your app into, for example, bound and context and, and um, all, all these best practices. But um, I also think that every um, case is, is a specific, like it helps up to a point, but then you get into specifics where you really have to think about, okay, why do each of these paradigms exist? What can I learn from them? And what can I maybe ignore selectively? So in this case, I thought about what would actually make sense here. I mean, when you think about the logic and then you have all this data preloaded in the beginning and you have to touch maybe six different places in, in order when, when some logic changes, when some rules change, um, what would actually make sense is to have all the logic in one place um, or to, in other words, to have it separate from how the logic's actually executed, which is, for example, preloading, and then um, like whether you use a cont uh, or enum or pattern matching or whatever. So the the kind of the logic in its uh, purest sense as possible. And there's actually a paradigm that I like a lot and that I've um, used um, successfully in the past. It's called declarative programming, which does exactly that. I read it out for you, expresses declarative prog programming, expresses the logic of a computation by describing what the program must accomplish in terms of the problem domain, rather than describe how to accomplish it. So this is the very general principle. Some common examples are database query languages like SQL, uh, regular expressions or logic programming. And um, I, I thought about using our uh, film and TV kind of actor schema, but I um, decided to keep it simple for you and, and take the good old boring uh, to-do list schema. So um, this is what I want to uh, use for, for these examples that, that I will now um, explain. Um, it's very simple. It's uh, actor schema, but I left out all the boilerplate. Um, you, we have a list uh, schema, title and archived at that has many tasks and a task that um, has a title, it has a complete at and belongs to the list. So of course, this is boiled down now. This is not nearly as complex as, as what we're dealing with, but I just want to like make, make uh, the points. Um, so, Declarative programming we um, is about, as we saw, um, separating the, the what or concentrating on the what um, as opposed to how to do it like in detail. So it was mentioned SQL is an example for that. And I want to give you an example how that relates. Um, so imperative, which is um, describing how to do something, that's the, the opposite of declarative. Um, would mean, for example, let's say if we could, um, if, if our database, uh, we use Postgres, for example, supported Elixir, then we could write the code for the database to, to come up with the result. So in this case, we want each uh, list with its name and the number of, of tasks associated with it. Um, so we just have a, a list of tasks and a list of to-do lists. And then we can use enum functions uh, mostly to, to make the relation. Maybe it could be um, more complex when we have indexes and so on. But um, let's say here we, we only have this. Um, declarative uh, is SQL, for example, um, because you basically you deal with tables and columns. And that's already one level of abstraction higher. So you don't have to write the actual logic to load the data, but um, you you can tell SQL or maybe use Ecto um, how to do it. And in this case, I mean, we could use a join and group by, or in this case, I chose to, to show it with a subquery. Um, so that's already one level of abstraction higher. And then you have DX, which um, is also declarative. But um, I mean, SQL is a, is a kind of a language, uh, 
so a string in, in, in programming terms that is parsed on the database side. So you don't have to deal with what tables are joined, how and when, like the ordering of things. That's what Postgres, for example, makes the execution plan for. You just have to tell it, here, these are the tables, these are the columns, and give me the result. And this simple logic of saying, OK, the name and the number of tasks for each list um, is expressed when using DX like this. You could say um, query all lists and select the name with, with the reference to the uh, so name. The first one is uh, basically what's returned in the map. And then the reference is uh, referencing the, the list name. Or a task count uh, is the name of the result. And then what's in there is the count of tasks. Because tasks is a known um, construct, it's an association. And uh, name with this uh, ref just means uh, we reference the existing field. Um, uh, but now let's take another example where we want to exclude archived lists. So as you might remember, there was on the list, there was an archive at, and you could guess already, okay, this means if there's a timestamp in there, then it's archived. And if not, it's not. But um, here comes the, the thing with um, what does it mean for a list to be archived? As I said, it's a very simple example, but this is um, the question that's important. Um, what what does what do certain um, terms mean? And that should ideally be very close to the business domain or the the domain of the users or experts. So this is where we um, also think about domain driven design. I don't know if you know the term. It's actually a host, it's a group of concepts, but um, one central, one key part of it, it aims to foster ubiquitous language, meaning that the domain model should form a common language shared by domain experts or users for describing system requirements, business users, sponsors, and developers. So the idea is that you think really hard about finding good names for things and actually naming things. So this is where um, DX um, comes in with, uh, OK, um, actually, we want to define what archived means. So let's define it. Um, we infer that the ar archived uh, property of a list is false when the archived add field is nil. And otherwise, um, it's archived. Um, so basically, um, you define, it's, it's like defining a new field on, on, on list on the schema, but uh, you don't set a specific value for each list, but you set a rule or several rules. In this case, we have two rules. One has a condition. So we can assume, or we can, basically the um, value false gets associated when um, the archive add field is nil and otherwise true. There's no condition. So like in pattern matching or case statements, the last one, when it doesn't have a condition, um, then it uh, always matches. So here we have two different values that this archive can have. And this is how we define basically what it means for us that it's archived. And the good thing is once we define it like this, then to exclude an archived list, we can use it in our queries. So in this case, um, query all takes three arguments. The first one is uh, what to query, the list. Second one is a condition. Um, so in this case, um, it's that archived is false because we want to exclude archived lists. So we say, give us only the not archived ones. And then the select is the same as before. Um, so this is uh, how we can extend the, the schema and uh, express the, the logic, express what it means for us in terms of uh, rules, and use that, for example, for querying. Or um, you can use it in other ways too. I can show you later. Um, 
So another example, let's say we want to introduce a list state. Um, that means the list is archived when, or the state, See, that's, <laughs> that's where the terminology, it's important to um, pay attention to detail. The list state is archived when the list is archived. This is what we just um, defined here, what, mean, what it means for us that it's archived. Um, the state of the list is active when it has some completed task, at least one. Um, the state should be ready when it has tasks, but none are completed, or the list should be empty when it has no tasks. And this can also be expressed in, in terms of logic using the X. So here we see the, the fields again, basically the, the what we've already seen before, the fields, the association, the archived, property, and now what's new is the last four lines in the module, the state. So the first one, the state is archived when our other property archived is true. So that refers to what we've already um, defined. And I think that's a really important concept because once you start giving things names and you, you agree on what it means, then you should also be able to express logic uh, referring to what, what you've already defined. And this is possible with DX. So you can basically compose your, your logic, your, your business logic, and um, yeah, build up, the basically build the complexity that you have in your, in your domain, in your business. Um, then the state is active when um, tasks, which is the um, association, has at least one um, task with the completed true, um, then we would have to define what completed means on the task, or maybe there's a field like it, or we can define it as a, as a property. Um, so tasks has many, but um, the default in DX for the condition is at least one uh, must match, because it's usually what, what you need, or in, at least by now that's, uh, in my experience. Um, then it's uh, the state is ready when there's a task, when there's any task basically with no condition. That's what the empty map here means. And then the fallback or the um, last um, rule is that the state is empty otherwise. So it goes from, from top to bottom, takes first one that where the condition matches. And that's what the, the the property's value is. And then you can use that in multiple ways. Um, so for example, you can have one list and you want to load the, the state for it. That's dx.load, which is return, for example, active. You can do it for many lists. So it always works for one or many. Um, then it will return you a, a list of, of the uh, states of each of the lists. You can do it as a query result, as we've seen earlier. But before we did the um, select, we got the name, and here we get we get a state. Name is a field, state is a property. But you can always use both interchangeably when using the X. And uh, you can use it as a query condition, so you can filter by it. Um, it will even um, translated to SQL to make the querying effective uh, on the database side. Or as I mentioned, you can reference your properties in other rules in other properties um, and build up or compose basically your, your business logic in that way. And what would actually make sense here is to have all logic in one place. Basically, once I started, uh, I mean, it, took a while basically to come up with this whole uh, concept and to implement parts of it. And um, once I migrated the first major chunks of logic from what we had before to the X to the rules, basically having all the rules in one place, I, um, it was like a revelation because I, for the first time understood what it actually does and could imagine, okay, what, what does it mean? Like for how, how do film people see that? Um, 
and that was not possible, at least not for me, when it was uh, scattered among uh, six different files and modules and burdened um, below enum calls and so on. So um, this is, a, is an approach that you can use. Um, basically, you define your logic once. You have, to you have to use this kind of declarative language, which is, of course, takes some learning, takes some getting used to. But um, then it's very expressive, and it's really um, effective to use it uh, then in your various uh, parts of your application. Thank you very much. Uh, here's the link to the repo. Um, feel free to contact me.